Right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this week's Monday Market Webinar with me, Michael Hewson. Um, I will be your host for the next half an hour in the absence of my colleague Jasper, who's decided to go on vacation for a couple of weeks. I've decided to give him a couple of weeks off because he works so hard. So um, you're stuck with me. Um, just to do a quick um, risk warning for compliance purposes, and then we can look ahead to we can look ahead to what's coming up this week, which on the calendar front is actually fairly thin. Um, we certainly don't have anywhere near as much data to get through this week as we did last week. And um, I think for most of this week, I mean, the, I think the focus is going to be obviously on the ongoing saga of Greece and will they, won't they default? And uh, will they come to an agreement with EU creditors after the um, decision to delay their Friday payment to the IMF and potentially roll them up all into one payment at the end of the month? Just to clarify, Friday's, Friday's repayment was 300 million euros. They've got a total of 1.6 billion euros, 1.5 billion euros, which they have to pay by June the 19th. The bailout, the current bailout extension expires at the end of this month. I'm not hopeful that we will get any sort of agreement between now and then, which for me means the best case scenario really is another extend and pretend type of scenario, but that doesn't really resolve Greece's cash flow problems. That being said, um, markets continue to remain fairly sanguine about a potential Greek default, but I think that is the most likely scenario at the moment. But until it happens, it's very hard to um, determine one way or another what markets will do when it finally happens. And trust me, it will finally happen at some point. It's just really a matter of matter of timing. So we'll we'll have a look at um, we'll have a look at the bond markets because the bond markets in particular have been particularly interesting. Those of you who saw my video. Um, about a month ago, uh, beginning of May, we'll know that um, the reversal that we saw in Bunds would appear to suggest that potentially we could well see further downside in Bund prices, which would then basically translate into high yields. Um, certainly if you look at um, the Bund price in the context of um, where, we, we, where, we, where we've come from, We've we've seen a significant decline, and when I, when I did this video in May, in May about just before the election a month ago, um, I talked about a bearish engulfing or a key reversal month, and suggested that we could be in for a significant correction not only on the Bund, but also on the German DAX as well. And this morning we have just tipped into correction territory on the German DAX. We can see that on this chart here. This is the ordinary chart that I was looking at as well a couple of months ago. And again, we had a bit of a, bit of a reversal there. If we actually look at the saved chart that I've done for this, we can actually see the way the price has actually staircased down. We do appear to have made a three-month low. We've broken below the May lows, um, but that still brings us into what I would call a little bit of a window of support between 10,980 and levels pretty much where we are now. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't see further declines, but certainly from what I can from what I can see here, the direction of travel does appear to suggest that potentially we may have seen a little bit of a top. Certainly, there's potential for a bit of a reversal. You could argue that this is a potentially a head and shoulders. You've got the left shoulder here, you've got the, the head there, and you've got the right shoulder here. It's pretty irregular, um, um, which does suggest that any move lower is likely to be susceptible to significant snapbacks. And certainly, if you look at some of the price action over the course of the past few days, we can see quite significant um, ranges in the context of the overall trading session throughout the day. So, for example, on Thursday, we got nearly a 300-point range on the German DAX. So, um, 
I certainly don't think we're out of the woods. And we've also seen a bit of a rebound in the euro. Now, we've talked about the rise in bond yields, but we've also seen bond yields and bond yields rise in U.S. Treasuries as well. And that can be borne out by this chart here, the U.S. 10-year note. We've seen a significant decline um, through some key support levels over the course of the last six months, which has pushed yields up to around about 2.4%. So U.S. 10-year Treasuries currently around 2.4%. German bunds currently around about 0.85%. Uh, so there's still a significant there's still a significant differentiation between uh, the yields that you get for um, owning a 10-year Treasury and a 10-year bund. But it's not just about that. It's also about it's also about the direction of travel with respect to the narrowing of uh, the spread between the 10-year U.S. Treasury and the German Bund. Now we can see here at our peak, um, if we look at the spread, I'm just going to click on that there so you can all see the chart that I'm looking at. At the peak here, 189 basis points also coincides pretty much more or less with the low in Euro dollar, give or take, um, give or take a few, give or take a few days. Let's just look at the daily chart here and we can we can see that. So we can, if we look at the, if we look at the, uh, the bullish reversal that we've seen on the monthly candle for euro dollar, that would appear to suggest that potentially we could have seen the lows in the euro. Now the reaction off the lows that we've seen thus far hasn't been what I would call particularly dynamic, but that's not altogether surprising, given the given how big this candle is here. If we look at the low on that candle, it comes in at 105.20 and the high comes in at 112.66. So you've got 700 points to play with there, which is quite an awful lot. Now, in May, we slipped all the way back to 108.20, which is obviously um, these lows that we saw over here. But overall, since we posted those lows in, um, in March, in March, April, We've also seen the differential between U.S. Treasuries and bond yields come in in favour of the euro. So basically, the further this chart here comes down here, the more euro positive it becomes. And this is the chart that I'm paying particular interest in in terms of interest rate expectations. It's not just about whether or not when you see the U.S. Fed raising rates. It's also about interest rate expectations in terms of the um, in terms of the European Central Bank. Now, no one expects the ECB to raise rates anytime soon. It's not about that. It's about the differentials between U.S. Treasuries and German bonds. And at the moment, these differentials on trend appear to be coming in in the euro's favour. So that I think that will limit any downside in euro dollar while we're tracking lower on these yield differentials. So while this chart here is pointing lower, and w when I go back to my Bund chart, there's certainly an awful lot more, there's, also, there's an awful lot more flexibility in terms of Bund prices to fall than there is in US Treasury prices. That's going to help underpin the euro dollar. Now, the key support level on the euro dollar is this 110.50 level, which I talked about in the webinar on Friday. When those payrolls numbers came out, and they were much better than expected, there's no disputing that, they were much better than expected, we saw a significant dollar rally. But they, while they were the best numbers that we've seen thus far this year, they still weren't anywhere near as good as the numbers that we saw at the end of last year. So the end of last year, if you look here, we've got 423 in November, 329 in December. Since then, we've seen 201, 266, 119. That was revised up from 85, 221, and 280. So, you know, it's not too shabby, but it also suggests that we're seeing a little bit of a slowdown in terms of jobs growth in the US economy. And when you actually dig down into the jobs data, an awful lot of the jobs that were added were at the lower end of the pay scale. 
what it also points to is that was that was probably the best of the economic data that we saw last week in terms of the overall US economy. Manufacturing still remains very weak. The US consumer also remains very reluctant to spend money. And while we did see an increase in average earnings, I think a large part of that was down to the fact that we've seen widespread increases in the minimum wage. And while that helps um, keep wages up at the lower end, I don't think it actually adds that much to the overall disposable income that U.S. consumers need to go out and hit the shops. And certainly that's one factor that I think that has been weighing down the U.S. economy. The U.S. consumer, despite the fiscal boost of the lower oil price, hasn't been going out and spending money. So we will get on Thursday U.S. retail sales numbers, which should give us a fairly good indication as to whether or not we've seen a significant rebound in U.S. consumer spending which thus far we haven't seen for the first four or five months of this year. Now, U.S. retail sales in April um, basically came in flat at 0%. U.S. retail sales for May were expecting a rise of 1.2%. That's quite a significant, that's a, that's a significantly punchy number. And um, I'm not sure how economists have arrived at that number. Nonetheless, it's certainly worth bearing in mind that if we do get a significant downward surprise on that, then we could well see a significant undermining of the dollar. And we can certainly see in the context of what we've had so far, retail sales over the course of the last few months, which is in this column here, we saw a 1.1% rise in March. But if you actually look at January and February, it didn't basically offset the declines that we saw in the first two months of the year. In April thus far we've seen 0%. We are expecting this number later this week. It remains to be seen as to whether or not we will get that number, but thus far US retail sales for this year are actually negative. Um, certainly if you look at durable goods, they don't paint a particularly pretty picture for U.S. consumer spending. This is core durable goods. It excludes transportation. So white goods, fairly big ticket items, U.S. consumer. We've only seen a gain one month out of the last six. So that once again points to a very weak U.S. consumer. And U.S. consumer spending makes up around about two-thirds of the U.S. economy. So we really do need a good number here for retail sales to prompt a significant rebound and push through 110.50 in the euro dollar. So let me just get rid of that and get rid of that, and then we can move on. So 110.50 is this level here in euro dollar. What we need to see is a move back above 112.20 to retarget the highs that we saw last week around about 113.80, and obviously the 114.80 level that we saw in mid-May. So that's the outlook for euro dollar. 110.50 on the downside, that's the key support level. Um, certainly if we look at the chart on a slightly longer term basis, we can actually draw in a trend line from the lows here, which comes in around about 108.85 or 108.90. So that's also worth keeping an eye on. And if we actually look at the daily chart, we can also see that the two moving averages here on the 50 and the 100 also look to be starting to turn positive. So again, that does appear to suggest that potentially we could well have seen a short-term base in euro dollar um, earlier this year. So that's worth keeping an eye on. Again, similar sort of story with the pound against the dollar as well. Um, we've got significant support again between the 50 and the 100 day moving averages. We can see that here on this chart here. I put some comments on the chart forum here on the right hand side if you want to have a look at that. As long as we hold above these 50 and 100 day moving averages, the recent rebound off the lows continues to remain intact. Let me just remove that trend line there. Um, so again, that sort of feeds into the narrative that maybe we've seen the US dollar peak in the short and medium term. And certainly if we look at my dollar index chart, we can sort of see that as well. This is a four hour chart that I'm looking at at the moment. I've drawn some Fibonacci retracements off the peaks that we saw in April, which is basically when Euro dollar 
bottomed out around about 104.50, and then obviously the peaks in the euro dollar around about 114.80, and the lows on the dollar index around about 93.16. We retraced 61.8, had a little bit of a double top here. We've seen a break lower, but we haven't actually broken back within the 96.70 level on the dollar index. So again, this pretty much ties in roughly around about 110.5, 110.20 on euro dollar. So certainly looking for confirmation of a rebound in the dollar. Um, but while we're below this 96.70 level, I, I would expect to see this drift back down and retest the lows that we saw um, earlier in May. So that again feeds into my weaker dollar narrative. Certainly if you look at the sterling dollar chart, again, it's a similar sort of story with respect to a slightly bullish candle. It's not as conclusive as it's not conclusive as Euro, the Euro dollar monthly candle was, and certainly the very long upper and lower shadows do appear to suggest that there is a significant indecision with respect to where we go next. But we certainly got a very nice weekly reversal um, earlier the, earlier this year in April, which did prompt the move back to around about 158. We are now starting to ratchet back down, but overall my key indicator for cable remains these two moving averages here, as well as the 150-170 lows that we saw earlier this month. Also feeding in to a slightly firmer Euro narrative was a couple of breakouts that I talked about last week in my weekly video, which were Euro Canada, or Euro Canada even, an inverse head and shoulders on the daily charts. We can see it here, the left shoulder here, the head there, the right shoulder there, slightly irregular, and obviously the key resistance that has now become support line at 137.80. Um, we can see that it's broken out quite nicely. We've reversed quite sharply on Friday because of the Canada jobs data as well as the US jobs data. We saw Euro dollar pull back quite sharply. And that certainly is a concern. But I think while we remain above 137.80, um, the potential for a continued Euro gains still remains fairly positive. Furthermore, if we look at the 200-week moving average on Euro Canada, we can see that it's had a, it has acted as support and resistance in fairly equal measure. We've closed above it. That's a very long shadow there, but overall, it's still fairly positive. And as long as we stay above the 200-week moving average on a weekly basis, then there's no reason to suppose we can't continue to push higher push above this 50-week moving average as long as we stay above the 200-week moving average. It's also a similar sort of story on Euro-Yen. And we can see that um, from this chart that I've got saved here. Again, this is the daily chart. We've seen a significant rebound from the peaks that we saw in December at 149.80, just below 150 and the lows that we saw in April at 126.10, 126.09. We've broken above the 200-day moving average. We've also broken above the 50% retracement level of the entire down move there, and we've been rebuffed by the 61.8% Fibonacci retracement level on the upside. So there's certainly potential here for a bit of a correction back to the 50% level, but overall the setup does appear to be fairly constructive. If we draw a line through the lows here again, we've got a nice little uptrend which is um, starting to unfold. The oscillator is starting to look a little bit overstretched on the daily chart, which would appear to suggest that maybe we'll probably get a little bit of a drift back down. But overall, while I think we, while we remain above the 200-day moving average, then I think the bias remains for this particular currency pair to continue to push higher. One other thing that's making me slightly less dollar bullish than everybody else is simply the fact that everyone is thinking the same thing. 
And when everyone starts to think the same thing, that's when I start to get a little bit nervous, a little bit twitchy, and start to think for reasons to go the other way. And looking at the price action here, it's making me a little bit cautious with respect to being overly dollar bullish, um, certainly in respect of euro dollar and cable, maybe not so much dollar yen. Um, the fundamentals there are, are fundamentally going to be positive for the dollar. But even there, there is some, I think there is potential scope for a little bit of what I would call a little bit of overstretch on the dollar yen. We have posted new peaks above 125.62, and those were the peaks that we last saw at the end of 2002. We can see that there, those twin peaks there at the end of 2002, around about 125.60. We have gone slightly above that today, around about 125.80. Um, so we, we do need to see a significant, significant push higher. And we can see that there's pretty much nothing above 125.80 or 125.60 until these 2002 peaks, which are around about 135. We can see that there, 134.95. So certainly looking at dollar yen, it is becoming a little bit overstretched, but um, trying to pick the top on that has been a pretty thankless task. And I'm not going to try and start pick, trying to pick the top on it now. Certainly the next support on the dollar yen is likely to be around about here. Those previous peaks that we saw around about 125. So what I would expect to see on the dollar yen is a break below 125 to suggest that we could see a further correction back to 123.75, 123.60, and that's certainly what I've articulated on the chart forums um, this morning. I say I update the chart forums every day for Euro Dollar Cable, Euro Sterling, and Dollar Yen. So um, generally, you'll get a fairly comprehensive snapshot of what I think with respect to those particular currency pairs on a day-to-day -day basis. As far as the indices are concerned, it's a slightly different story because we've certainly seen a significant correction and the move lower that we've seen in the Bunds as well as the German DAX I think has been prompted by the fact that there is a perception that possibly Euro Dollar we may have seen the lows. We've already talked about um, the DAX breaking down. Um, I'm a little bit cautious about getting overly aggressive on further losses on the DAX simply because we're not seeing a significant break lower on the other European indices that we talked about here. Now, a few weeks ago, I talked about the fact that the DAX broke to the upside when, in fact, the Euro stocks 50 didn't. And that's equally true on the downside. The DAX has broken lower, but the Euro stocks 50 hasn't. And that, for me, I think is, I think, one of the key levels here around about where we are now. 3,480 coincides with the May lows. We've marginally broken below that, but we haven't aggressively broken below it. And that makes me a little bit cautious about getting getting overly overly bearish on this particular index. I think what's, how, what's weighing the Euro stocks 50 down at the moment is the fact that the CAC 40, if we look at it here, is also holding above a fairly key support level um, at the moment. So, and that's around about 4,870, just around about eight points below where we are at the moment. 4,874, we can see the lows in March. Fairly key support level. Let's draw that in between 48.56. So we can see that once again, European equity markets, certainly the blue chip ones, are at around and close to key support levels. It's a similar sort of story if we also look at the FTSE MIB or the Italian 40. Again, we're still well above a key support level there. Um, so again, we have to be a little bit careful about being overly gung-ho about the market trading lower, 22,400 there on the downside. 
is a key support level. Certainly, I think what's helping the DAX today is a rebound in Deutsche Bank in the wake of the resignations, the joint resignations of the two CEOs. And we can see here again on the Spanish IBEX that um, we are also near a fairly key support level, albeit in a fairly downward trend. But again, we can see potential for a little bit of a head and shoulders formation here, but we'll only get that on a break, I think, below the 200-day moving average, though with respect to this 200-day moving average, it's fairly flat. So I wouldn't expect to see a big reaction on a break below it, but certainly I think the, these, these, top, these topping formations do appear to suggest that there's an awful lot of uncertainty in European equity markets at the moment, and I think a large part of that is down to the fact that we're getting a little pickup in inflationary pressures. Um, I think the bond market move had got a little bit too one-sided, and we're getting in a little bit of a, a little bit of a pullback on prices and a push higher in yields, and that's going to be broadly euro supportive until or unless we get a conclusion on what's going on in Athens and and, and the Greek and the Greek uh, the Greek debt uh, debacle, for want of a better word. So. Let's have a quick look at now we've now we've looked at European markets and the euro. Let's have a look at the U.S. markets. There's not really much to see here. It's pretty dull. Um, we can certainly see that we continue to trade in a range here. We're probably at the lower end of the recent range. We can certainly draw a line through here on the lows, which suggests that if we get anywhere close to 2070 on the S&P 500, we're likely to see a little bit of a rebound, but certainly I think those payrolls numbers, in addition to the fact that we saw some, I think what you could call fairly dovish talk from policymakers, Fed policymakers last week, from Charles Evans of the Chicago Fed, from Lael Brainerd, who is a permanent voting member of the FOMC, and also James Bullard, who's the St. Louis Fed, who has, for the most part of this year, been calling for a, for a rise in U.S. rates, he's now tempered those calls ever so slightly in light of the weak economic data out of the U.S. So for someone like Mr. Bullard, who has been calling for rate rises, to suddenly row back on that, I think it makes it unlikely that um, we'll see any move in June. And to be quite honest, any move in June was off the table even before um, Friday's payrolls numbers. It's, it's way too soon if it's data dependent. And for me, it's really about sequencing. Do we get a rate rise in September? It's unlikely that we're going to get a move on the Fed's inflation forecasts in the June meeting, and it's unlikely that we'll get a move on the Fed's growth forecasts. And both of those were downgraded in March. Now, the Fed upgrades its growth and inflation forecasts every quarter. So if they don't do anything in June, and they're not likely to, then the next time they can upgrade their growth and inflation forecasts will be in September. Now, I think, I think it's unlikely that they will upgrade their growth and inflation forecasts in September and raise rates. They will, they will, I think it's more likely that if they're going to raise rates this year, they'll move on their growth and inflation forecasts in September which means that the earliest that they can raise rates is either in October or December. If they don't move on their inflation and growth forecast in September, then it's hard to see how they can raise rates this year. And that, for me, I think is really the, the, key, the key factor, I think. When people talk about putting a rate rise back on the table in September, I think the Fed would have to signal that they're happy that growth and inflation is starting to move higher. And at the moment, there's certainly no evidence of that, despite the fact that um, average earnings data has edged up ever so slightly. You've also got Chinese data, and that continues to disappoint. If you've got China exporting deflation to the rest of the world, it's hard to see how inflation in the U.S. is going to pick up strong with dollar obviously notwithstanding, and a strong currency, as we all know, is deflationary or disinflationary, whatever you want to call it. So Chinese trade data that we saw 
earlier this morning was once again disappointing. We saw exports slide further much more aggressively than we thought that they would do. Um, the import and export data, it does make for worrying reading. We saw a 2.4% decline in exports, which was slightly better than we were expecting, but it's still a decline. But imports slid 17.6%. That's even more than in April. And it raises concerns that the likelihood is we're going to see further easing by Chinese authorities. And it's going to make it that much more difficult for the Chinese to meet their growth target of 7%. So, so for me, if, if China's exporting deflation, and we heard this morning that China's, China is cutting energy prices, it's cutting electricity prices, it's cutting um, natural gas prices, um, I tweeted that this morning, that's going to have a deflationary effect. And I think it's likely to ripple out through the rest of the world. So... Again, I think it's, un it's going to make it that much more difficult for the Fed to raise rates. Also, the IMF intervention was very unwelcome, I think, from the Fed's point of view. Does that mean that they're going to basically raise rates irrespective of what the IMF do? I think, again, you know, it's, it's up for debate. The market thinks that the Fed will raise rates this year. I still think it's 50-50, and I'm still inclined to think that they probably won't, but... Um, follow the price action and listen, listen, listen to the headlines and look at the price action. The price action for me does appear to suggest that we could have seen a short-term top in the US dollar. Irrespective of what anyone else says, go, I always go with the price action. Looking at gold and other precious metals, again, we can see that we're in a range here not really telling us anything we don't already know. We can see that there's significantly a good area of support between 11.50 and 11.70 and resistance to 12.23, 12.43. So trade the range on that. It's not really going to offer you too much. Brent crude, similar sort of story I would suggest, though we are on a key support level on this particular chart here, around about $61 a barrel. We saw it rebound off that line on Friday. And it's also the trend line that I've drawn in from the 2015 lows. But again, here, we're seeing what I would call lower highs. So I think if we're going to see further gains in the oil price, we really need to get back above the June highs that we saw earlier this month, around about $65, $66 a barrel. The fact that OPEC left production levels unchanged, um, would appear to suggest that it's unlikely that we're going to see a significant takeoff in the oil price because it's still a supply and demand story and there's still much more supply than there is demand and as such I think that's going to make it very, very difficult for the oil price to rally significantly aggressively notwithstanding the fact that I think the rig counts in the US have probably fallen about as far as they can. So in terms of the WTI price, Again, it's a similar sort of story. We're trading in a broad sideways channel, albeit with a slight, very slight negative bias um, with resistance just above, just around $60 a barrel. So certainly can keep an eye on that. That looks fairly bearish there. But again, I'm not expecting too much in the way of volatility in terms of are breaking out either side of this range. We're not expecting that. I think we'll retest potentially the lows that we saw in May. Um, but overall, I think the bias is we're going to get into a little bit of a new range with respect to WTI. Let's have a quick look at dollar CAD. For all you CAD aficionados over there, we've had a bit of a breakout on this particular chart here. But overall, um, if we look at the, this is a four-hour chart, we can see here that there's still, we're still in a bit of a downtrend from the March highs. And what we really want to see is a move above the peak that we saw on Friday, which is around about 125.60. So that's a big, big level there. I think the key support remains around about 123.50 on the downside. Certainly the oscillator is significantly overbought which would appear to suggest that potentially there's probably more downside than there is upside. Currently where we are now, 
it's in it's in no man's land with respect to the resistance and the support levels. So I would probably be cautious about getting too involved in that particular currency pair at this point in time. Um, let's finish up with the Australian dollar. That's been a little bit more difficult to pick over the course of the last few months. I thought that it, I thought this would actually go an awfully awful lot higher. It actually hasn't done that. And the reason I thought that was because it posted a significantly bullish reversal on the um, on the monthly candle. But we pretty much given back not all of it, but a good portion of it. I think it's significant that we haven't broken below 75.30, and that does bode well um, for further Aussie gains. But I think it's obviously suffering from a perception that we're seeing a little bit of, we've seen some very disappointing Australian economic data, and that's feeding into a narrative of potentially that the RBA could actually cut rates further. I'm, I'm still doubtful that they will do that. But you never know, and we can see from here, this chart here, that there's pretty solid support just below 76, around about 75.95, and then below that, uh, the uh, April low is around about 75.30. Um, let's have a quick look at the Turkish lira, because that's been a bit nasty over the course of the last few trading sessions. Looking at a weekly chart, we can see that as a result of the Turkish elections, We've had a nice little gap higher. I have to say this is not something. This is something that I would steer well clear of, simply because it's just way too volatile. But it certainly makes for an interesting-looking chart. And given the way that this this has moved, you'd have to think that this gap will probably get filled at some point over the course of the next few days. But you're going to need deep pockets to play this particular market. Anyway. Um, that's pretty much it for this week, ladies and gents, um, if, unless you have any questions that you want to address to me right now.